going on back to truth over tea today we have a very special guest mr planet peterson the science teacher that will be here with us today having a discussion on neo-darwinian evolution um so thank you so much for joining today peterson i appreciate that why don't you give our audience a little explanation or a little bit about yourself sure yeah um so i'm mostly known on TikTok. uh I go by Planet Peterson on all my platforms. I have a YouTube channel too, Instagram. Um, and I, I'm i a high school science teacher. I have been for going on nine years now. I've taught pretty much every subject, um, but I my, my degree is in biology and my, my most experience with teaching is teaching like the earth sciences, astronomy and biology, as well as like anatomy and physiology. But I've also taught chemistry and physics and physical science before as well. Um, and I, I'm mostly known on TikTok for debating people. Uh, it started with flat earth stuff, but um, I talk about, I talk about evolution and climate change and uh, again, the flat earth and just kind of science and logic in general and things like that. True. Okay. Awesome. I I saw a couple of the videos on your uh, on your TikTok of people debating flat earth. I didn't even know that flat earth was really like popular. I, I, I didn't know anybody believed in I that until existed. I got on TikTok. Yeah, I knew it existed, but I didn't know it was so popular. But yeah. Like that was very shocking to me. Uh <laughs> yeah. and then I've never debated anybody um on flat earth and what's 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 crazy is a lot of the times they're creationists and so they'll you know they say that the bible supports flat earth and, and yeah. so i'm surprised i haven't gotten any of those people yet because i i try to go live like once a week on tiktok but anyways um and then i saw that the guy you were debating who said dinosaurs didn't exist and that was uh <laughs> they were oh, they were just man. big lizards yeah that's, that's <laughs> nick i know exactly who you're talking about mm. okay so he's he's infamous for <clears throat> for that conversation. You would call him not on Nick because that was his response to everything I would say is not on. Not on Nick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, so basically, our view. I'm a, I'm a young Earth creationist. I am a Christian, um, and so I that obviously Darwinian neo Darwinian evolution doesn't fit with our view, um, and Brennan feels pretty much the same as I do. So I. Tell me, like, what, um, how did you come to believe in neo Darwinian evolution? Was this something that you learned in school, something teaching brought to you, or like, where did you come to this? I know it was taught in school, but I don't remember it at all. Um, I just, I just don't. Oh, well, I mean, if I'm saying that, then I, I don't know how I can claim that, uh, it was taught in school if I don't remember it at all, then, but I mean, I'm pretty sure it was because I know it's been part of the curriculum, uh, where I grew up. Um, but I, I just, like, as a kid, I watched educational TV cause YouTube didn't even exist until 2007 or whatever it was. Um, so I was every young kid, especially every young boy is fascinated by dinosaurs. I I'll be 32 in a few days and I'm just, I'm just an old boy who still loves dinosaurs, you know? <laughs> so I just always wanted to learn about animals and stuff. And so I would just, I, I don't remember at what point in my life I was like, yeah, evolution is a thing. I don't know, I guess exactly. Um, I only took one evolution class in college and the professor was on his way out and he didn't take it super seriously. So I didn't get too much from that. I've learned most of what I know about it just by reading books and uh, now YouTube does exist. So I uh, have <laughs> watched so much on there and I guess like some podcasts and stuff like that okay true that's I, and I grew up but sorry i i should yeah. have included this i did grow up religious uh i was raised i was kind of raised when i was really young my parents separated when i was young but lived really close mm -hmm. to each other so when i was really young i would go to sunday school at a lutheran church uh because i was closer to where my dad was but then as i got older i got uh that i was going to catholic mass with my mom and i got baptized and confirmed and all that stuff. And, but I, I never didn't believe in evolution. Um, but I believed in God and all that. Um, I'm an agnostic atheist today, 
but that really only happened when I was around like 25 years old, I would say. Okay. Gotcha. And, and just to be clear, when I say that we don't, evolution doesn't fit our worldview, uh, that when I say evolution specifically neo-Darwinian, there are forms of evolution. Like this is like a very <clears throat> convoluted term nowadays. And like evolution, the, the term is obvious. It, it, we've observed it in the lab. We've seen, you know, we can make a liger. That is an example of evolution we've, it, of, of artificial speciation. Um, <clears throat> and so th these things that we, I don't disagree with that. And, and Brendan doesn't disagree with that either. The, the, I guess the, the issue that I have with it, because I was taught evolution in, in high school that was, you know, had to test on earth space science in ninth grade. And then that kind of trickles out through biology after that and chemistry, because it all ties into that worldview that we have an earth, you know, we, we won't, we don't need to necessarily get into the universe at this point, but the earth, right? 4.6 billion years old. And then the first life is supposed to hit somewhere around 4 billion years ago. And over time, this is going to become to where we are today over that 4 billion year span. So to me that, that even before I was concerned about uh, biblical creation and having um, and, and the science that I've seen now that, that I think would support my view, I always thought that was strange. And so I guess like, did, did you ever question when you first heard this? What was what was your response? Like the claim that Earth is billions of years old, because that is an impossible number to wrap your head around. Is, is that what you mean? Well, more, more like that we all came from a single, we all have the same ancestor, all of life. Sure. Um, yeah, again, I don't remember when the first time I heard that was. Um, I, I never, so when I was younger, I, I wouldn't say I really thought about it. Too, I didn't think about the implications for it too seriously. Um, I never heard it. And it was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, but I remember, I, I don't think I ever doubted that humans evolved. Um, but then I, I never really thought about what that meant for like my faith. Like, well, if humans evolved, then th there is no Adam and Eve. Some people who believe in evolution and uh, Christianity, like uh, Ken Miller, who's the author of the most popular biology book that most schools use in the country. Uh, I think you guys know who Inspiring Philosophy is. Um, mm -hmm. Theistic evolution. They, they find a way to believe in it. Um, to me, it's just not really super compatible. So, um, but I've had I've had all kinds of doubts. I, I shouldn't say doubts, but there there have been all kinds of instances, um, and, and they still happen where there's a problem, and I'm like, oh yeah, th that seems that's kind of tricky. And so, but that just, it, that, that inspires me to look more into it. Some things are beyond my ability to comprehend. So sometimes I, I run into dead ends, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I just accepted evolution uncritically. I mean, to me, it makes good logical sense, even though it's, even though it's kind of hard to imagine at times. Okay. Ahead, okay, so was evolution then like instrumental in getting you to the place where you would then, uh, I guess, reject Christianity? Was that like involved at all? Or is that just kind of like something that I, happened on the side? So I, I would say my faith had been eroding for a long time before I ever got to that point. I would say that was a that was a critical thing, but it it didn't start with that at all. Okay. I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't say it's kind of like the, we, we think dinosaurs were killed by the asteroid. Right. And it's like, well, actually they were really on the brink of extinction. A lot of them were before that because of a bunch of eruptions in India. Um, I've never heard that. That's really interesting. Yeah. There's this fascinating region of India, uh, the, the Indus river Valley civilization. They literally, you know what Petra is in Jordan, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Indus River Valley Civilization, I believe this is the one anyways, they carved their buildings into volcanic rock. And that volcanic rock is dated to uh, a little before the the uh, asteroid impacted the Earth. So we're pretty sure that that was, th that was causing a catastrophic series of extinctions on our planet before the asteroid got there. The asteroid was just like, now you're done. That's that's really okay. interesting. I know we'll get into this later, um, depending on, you know, the scope of the discussion. Um, if we touch age of the earth, 
we may touch the flood. Yeah, I, so and in the I, flood, I, well, go ahead. Say you sound like you're about to say something interesting. Yeah, I was just gonna say I, I'd rather focus on the evolution. This is something Adam and I were talking about. Is like we have there is a big list of things, and I'm happy to talk about all of them. But if we focus on just one thing today, then I have a reason to come back because there's things that we never got to. So. True. Okay. Okay. Well said. It's just with volcanic eruptions and a lot of them, that's something creationists posit also that would have happened with tectonic movements during the flood. So that, that would just mm -hmm. be interesting, but yeah, that's actually a good point. Maybe we don't have to, you know, cause yeah. evolution touches <clears throat> so many different topics. We don't necessarily need to hit all of them today. Well, we won't yeah. be able to, it's not possible. We would need days. <laughs> we would yeah. need like 24 hour live stream. <laughs> and, um, I, I watched pretty much the the whole discussion you two had with Cease and uh, the girl whose name I don't remember. And I remember you guys, yeah. it started off by you saying that um, your problem with evolution uh, is, is with the science, not really with the Bible. So what I, what I was hoping is for this discussion, yeah, um, we would just debate the merits of evolution and divorce ourselves from like biblical arguments because... Um, that, that apparently isn't the point um, d behind your guys' reasoning anyways. Um, but I would hope that we can both agree that arguing from scientific evidence is the best we can do at being unbiased. It would be pointless, like, unless you, uh, we're not presuppositionalists. So unless you were a Christian, like, what's the point of using the Bible as as evidence? And plus, the Bible is not a scientific document. Um it, we agree with it. I'm glad so, you say that. <clears throat> well, yeah, because it's yeah. it's more of a, a, a historical, philosophical type document. It's not going to tell you, uh, you know, how the world, you know, how the laws of physics work. And, and I've heard people say things like this. But ultimately, we we can stick to the the creation science as opposed to the the um, um, the standard or conventional science conventional paradigm pretty much that's what it is it's it's two paradigms you have the creation paradigm and then the conventional paradigm so mm -hmm. like i guess genetic entropy would be one of the the big topics and i know you you said you were looking that up since the last time we had spoke about it so did you get a chance to like watch any lectures or anything from dr sanford john sanford um i read a, a paper that he authored um uh yesterday and part of today so there are there are parts from that paper we can discuss but then i, I looked into okay. genetic entropy and i looked into some of the criticisms of it and all that so yeah i i, I took tons of notes on it so i'm i'm happy okay. to go over it um uh but what i think we should start with is you frame genetic entropy because if I'm biased, I'm the only person that doesn't know it. So I could straw man the ever living crap out of genetic entropy <laughs> to make myself sound good. So, sure. yeah. So genetic well, entropy. Really quick before you say that, Adam. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you said this a minute ago, but um, just to go off what you just said earlier, Peterson, about our belief in evolution, where that comes from, or our disbelief. Uh, so we'll stick to the sciences, and we think that's good because both of us. Uh, well, you and us, we presuppose that science is a way to reach truth. And so we'll we'll start with our common body of presuppositions. But like with um, we do actually reason that because evolution is incompatible with Genesis, that is another reason to not believe evolution. Of course, like I said, you know, because you don't believe Genesis, it would be useless for us to go through Genesis to try to use that as evidence to convince you. So uh so yeah, yeah. Now I think there's the right uh, place for us to start from. Sure. Okay. So genetic entropy, essentially we go through a series of genetic mutations over time. Each generation is going to have more genetic uh, mutations than the previous generation. I have a certain amount, depending on my age, more than my parents, and then my parents have more than their parents and so on and so forth. And so that's like the basic easy understanding it's just a series of mutation mutations that go down generation after generation and this is all species have this same issue right so uh every here's how i understood it yeah every every generation has uh new mutations that the generation before them didn't have 
Uh, Sanford also makes the claim that most mutations are harmful. Uh, uh, well, there are a bunch of claims. I have them in bullet points, but that's one of them. And also the frequency of, of harmful mutations uh, steadily increases. That one, I looked into some of the mathematics, but mathematics is not my strong suit. So uh, that one will probably just have to be left where it is. Um, but anyways, it's, does that sound... That, that sounds like the theory as you understood it. Yeah. And the increases are like really minute. Um, they, the ones, because genetic entropy as a, as a basic concept, this is not disputed amongst geneticists. This is a pretty common accepted topic. Um, what, how it affects like evolution, so to say, um, that's a different story. But as far as the actual mutations being observed, we've we've done tests on it. If you, did, did you read the paper from Sanford um, doing the mitochondrial Eve uh, yes. Y chromosome Adam? Okay, which yeah, one? I have a whole section on that, but I <clears throat> I just I just want to go through the theory first. Sure. Um, in in general, so um, I just have a whole list of things. I'm not. I don't, I'd like to go through them all, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna list all of them. We can just do like one by one or whatever. Yep. Um, so one of the problems with genetic entropy is that, to me, the way I read into it is, it assumes that natural selection doesn't play a role. I guess one thing I should say is, I know that you guys. Um, I, I know we weren't gonna focus on like the Bible or whatever, but you believe that like the the flood happened. There were animals on the ark, but there are one and a half million documented species. You don't think one and a half million pairs of animals around the ark. You think it was much fewer and they diversified after the flood. Yes, yes. sir. Do you, so I'm, I'm actually kind of confused. Do you think that natural selection is the, the mechanism behind what caused them to speciate after the flood? Or do you think yeah. that natural selection isn't even. Natural selection is definitely involved in speciation okay. after the ark. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I, I figured, but I, that was, that was important to start with, I think. Um, but I don't think, so genetic entropy seems like it doesn't take into account natural selection as a role because in reality, um, individuals with harmful mutations don't pass down their genes nearly as often as individuals who don't have them. Uh, the vat, in fact, the vast majority of all organisms never reproduce. So. I feel like you'd have to believe that every single offspring always inherits harmful mutations and reject that some organisms are more fit to their environment or that every member or, or alternatively, you'd have to believe, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a bell curve of fitness, but every member contributes to reproduction. So ultimately like, it doesn't let's say we're we're at that point of, of getting off the ark and we now have x amount of what the biblical word would be kind which is very close to uh family on the mm -hmm. taxonomic scale so um the natural selection it, like it sounded like what you were saying was it's kind of like they're at odds with each other because you're not going to have natural selection take place while these animals are also mutating the the, the genes are mutating because natural selection is going to allow the ones with better genes to survive. And then genetic entropy would say that all of them are going through the same problem and all of them are having issues with their genetic yeah. code. In order for genetic entropy to be the observed phenomenon that is happening, you have to assume that the, the harmful mutations in perpetuity continue to be passed down and inherited. And that's just, that's incompatible with natural selection. Well, I, I, it was, it's more like, for example, if a dog, let's, let's look at a, a medium haired dog, 75 pound dog lives in, uh, Northern Canada has to go up North to find food for whatever reason. And then it's, it's two of these dogs, I'm sorry. And so they breed and then they have six puppies <laughs> and two of them are long haired. Two of them are medium haired. Two of them are short haired. The, the, short hair and the medium hair are eventually going to die off if they have to live in an arctic climate along with the parents because they'll need the long hair to keep their bodies warm and to regulate the temperature eventually turn white so on and so forth um <clears throat> that would go along with genetic entropy because the mutations 
may not that won't necessarily have to do with survivability at this point other than those specific genes so they may all have the same amount of mutations but just different t kinds of mutations so like all of those siblings won't have the exact same mutations they'll have similar maybe because they have the same parents but the ones that had the mutations that happened to give them long hair that's natural selection killing off the other ones and them surviving so I don't think that would be inconsistent with the biblical timeline. Well, I think what well, no, 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 Peter's not the biblical saying, timeline. I'm talking about genetic entropy. You're you're doubting whether uh, any mutations that accrue in the gene code would actually all be passed down, because not all that many organisms actually even get to reproduce. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, tons okay. of alleles never never make it because of that. Okay, <laughs> well, I mean. That wouldn't mean that genetic entropy isn't passed down. It would just mean that it would be slowed. And so if we're still measuring it nowadays, that would still be something. You know, it wouldn't say that it would have to necessarily stop because few organisms reproduce. Um, yeah, I, but I just don't think that's an accurate reading of, of Sanford. Is it, it's Sanford, right? Not Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think that's an accurate reading of Sanford's claims because he claims that the the majority of well he claims that the major there, there's actually several things the majority of of mutations are harmful mm -hmm. and um I, i'd like to unpack that later on much much later on um but also he says that harmful mutations continue to accumulate so if you would graph it um if we would graph this the graph would look like beneficial or neutral mutations here harmful mutations here the graph would look like that they diverge and harmful mutations rise but uh, I, that just, because of natural selection, that won't happen. So I just don't think that genetic entropy, again, I'm not arguing like against a biblical timeline or anything here. I'm just arguing that yeah. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. genetic entropy doesn't make sense in the light of, of natural selection. And I, I don't think it makes sense in the light of experimental evidence either. Um, I mean, are there I, not mutations that build up in the gene code, but don't necessarily manifest in some phenotype? So it doesn't have any say necessarily in natural selection yet. Natural selection only comes into play when you have some kind of phenotype, you know, which is a, well, you know, you're a science teacher, you know, a manifestation <laughs> of some trait that actually kind of helps something survive. And so if it hasn't manifested, but you just have these mutations in the gene code, then it wouldn't prevent it from being passed down natural selection it would be yeah invisible to natural selection yeah but genetic entropy again it, one of the core parts of the of the idea is that most mutations are harmful so like we're, we're all three disagreeing with that well i'm not i'm not saying that most mutations aren't har harmful um not to use a double negative kind of sort of there but um I don't think that that would necessarily go against natural selection because if if said siblings or said group of animals, not all of them are going to get the same mutations. And it just so happens that, you know, this group got the one that made it work so they could live in the cave or so they could live in the snow or so they could live wherever yeah. and it, they'll be okay. Whereas the other ones, which had other forms of mutations that did not help them, which was that that would still follow under uh, natural selection. Yeah, but I, I just, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself over and over again. Yes, that does follow natural selection, but not genetic entropy, which uh, assumes that most mutations are harmful. Um, there's a really cool experiment where they, they tested for something kind of like this. Um, it's by Sarah Joseph and David Wall. Um, mm. It's called the, it's called a forced inbreeding experiment and they, they used yeast. So the, don't call who's, who's the who's the animal Inhumane version of, of who's the animal version of hr i'm not sure who that Eda. is They're, well <laughs> no i mean like in in term with like uh, regards to scientific research um because there are actually ethical guidelines for using animals or whatever but oh. what they do is they graph um they graph the fitness of a group of organisms yeast and what you find is a really tight bell curve over one so one just means like uh, it, it matches like their normal because fitness is measured by your ability to reproduce. That's really what fitness is. So some individuals are a little bit better than the average individual. Uh, in other words, they propagate quicker. 
others are slightly worse. So these, these experiments are really cool. What they do is they force the, the yeast to inbreed, which what that does is it removes natural selection. So we know that inbreeding causes harmful alleles to accumulate in your gene pool, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So by doing the, the forced inbreeding or whatever, it removes natural selection as a corrective mechanism. And what you find is that that bell curve, instead of being really tight, uh, we call that stabilizing selection. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but instead it it flattens out and at the extreme ends, it extends greatly. So now you get some yeast who their fitness is way, way, way negative, where, where that didn't exist in the in the original population. Um, so what that what that tells us, what the forced inbreeding tells us, or when you compare that to the <clears throat> to the genome, genomic composition, whatever of the or no, we're not actually looking at the genomes. We're just looking at fitness. When you compare that before you do the inbreeding, um, the data clearly shows that natural selection cures a population of harmful mutations. Because when you remove natural selection, you see a, a great, you see a lot more organisms with very low fitness. Um, now, what's really weird is inbreeding actually produces more beneficial mutations than natural selection does. Um, but so that proves that mutations can be beneficial, but you also get quite, I argue it's probably offset by the great number of harmful mutations. Okay. So I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I think I'm looking at the same thing you're talking about. Is that the university of Chicago? Oh, I didn't write down what university it was, but that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, sorry. But, so these, I guess one of the questions I would have is what would the, I don't know if this is a valid question or not, but in looking at the yeast, like what was the amount of genetic mutations that it had as opposed to like, like how do you measure, is this a healthier yeast with less genetic mutations or, or is fit. this one? Yeah, fit, with I guess. fitness, by the rate at which they reproduce. So it actually isn't, I, I'm, I don't think they even sequenced their genomes. Maybe they did, but we actually don't need to. It was just a study in uh, fitness. So they just looked at their their reproductive rate, essentially. So before the inbreeding, it was it was really tight because natural selection again was was weeding out those that had uh, an unfavorable traits that led to unfavor. They were out competed by their fellow members that had better reproductive rates, right? And then when they force the inbreeding and remove natural selection, uh, then that allows all these harmful mutations to, well. I'm saying mutations. We're we're assuming that mutations are occurring, but that's the only way that organisms vary from one another within a population. Um, yeah, they're they're just graphing fitness, which is measured by the rate at which they reproduce. Okay, so I guess would you? So is your issue more so since these two kind of seem to have an issue? Like, do you do you think that genetic entropy is a legitimate like issue that we face? Mm -mm. Or do you think, okay, so you don't think that we're not, we're getting an X amount of mutations over a series of generations. I, so I agree that mutations happen, but I think the specific implications or the, the specific claims of genetic entropy, I think are bunk because again, it's, it's centered around the idea that um, several things, but one, the only one I'm focusing on right now is Sanford claims that most mutations are harmful. So I wouldn't. Okay. So, well, hold on. So you're yeah. saying then that natural selection is such a powerful mechanism that it's able to remove all the harmful mutations? No, not all. But um, and we can get into this because there are um, what are they called? Fancy word. I forgot what it was. Um, uh, uh, what is it called? I'm sorry compensatory mutations. I'm sorry. There are also hmm. compensatory mutations, which well, we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, yeah, natural selection is powerful enough to remove the influence of harmful mutations from a population. So I think that forced inbreeding experiment backs that up. And it's very possible that I did a terrible job explaining it. It's it's best explained by looking at, at the data uh, rather than listening to me 
explain the data, but no, I think this is really interesting, and I appreciate that you brought that up. Um, I admit I should have maybe read Dr. Sanford's uh, article before joining this debate, but um, I'll put it in the comments. Just, well, thank you, but it just seems to me, and I think you're making a good argument here, but it just seems to me kind of a stretch to say because natural selection is able to remove some bad characteristics out of the gene code that um bad characteristics as a whole or like are not passed down enough to endanger an organism in the long run you know because that's one thing that i know dr sanford gets to later on is he argues that uh humanity should not have been able to live one hundred thousand years you know or the proper timeline from homo erectus all the way to where we are today uh that we would have died over and over again because of these this uh buildup of uh mutations harmful mutations in our gene code you know um so he's saying like it's this big thing that actually limits an organism from being able to live for a certain amount of time like you would yeah. eventually not be able to function anymore and you're saying natural <laughs> selection is powerful enough to prevent that from happening um which i do think is kind of interesting um, but then, then you would have to say that all bad characteristics, like, like it's effectively stopped, you know, they're either stopped or they just don't manifest that to say that an organism could continue reproducing ad infinitum and it would never come to a point where they'd have to stop at some point. You know, I just, it seems a big claim, but I don't have the exact data to say, oh, well, here's an in instance where natural selection wasn't able to do anything with this bad mutation and it still ended up causing the organism to die to not survive sure although um, i might be able to think of it if i think for a minute you go ahead sure um the the thing i don't know if you wrote down the or yeah you had it because of the chicago paper or whatever but I, I encourage you to look at the the forced inbreeding one because to me that that clearly shows the um the, the influence of of natural selection because when the when you remove natural selection, when you force them to breed the way you want them to breed instead of the way they naturally breed, then you see decreases in fitness. Uh, whereas if you leave them alone, uh, there's this, there's this um, biologist who has a really famous quote. I can't remember what his name was, but he says, natural selection is more clever than you are, right? So it has these ways of uh, um, correcting for it. But um, it's not just natural selection. Because, um, like I said, Sanford, he explicitly says that most mutations are harmful. And I don't think that's true. Um, and we can go over that later. But even if it was true, I, I don't think that that's really th that great of a point because we have non-random mating, uh, natural selection, which we've already gone over, uh, sexual selection, predation, disease, parasites, and probably more things. Um, that control for that, that act basically as um, a sieve for individuals that aren't well fit into their environment. Um, and again, the vast majority of organisms don't reproduce. Uh, only, only a few do, and only the ones that uh, have the best fitness do. So it continues driving the, well, it, it helps keep the population in stabilizing selection because of that. Okay, so it, it well, could we do totally have possible. some organisms that have died out because they were not able to survive. Yeah, most um, things do. I that mean, that, happens that's a lot. Right? That's the yeah, problem okay, with okay. life. Yeah, okay. most things go extinct. Um, it's, it's incredibly hard to exist Why did they go extinct, though? Because natural selection was not enough to make them able to survive the next problem. Well, and, evolution, I, I mean, is evolution even the right word? Like, life in general is really incredibly inefficient actually um the the only thing that allows organisms to continue surviving is the fact that there's so much uh diversity within a population because you you get th that's the only way to try and guarantee some some like statistical chance of being able to survive in a changing environment i mean the reason things go extinct is because the environment changes for so-called living fossils, the, the reason they are the way they are is because their environment doesn't change. 
Um, really, I don't appreciate think you going the there. You went right there. You went there in the last debate too. Yeah, like the coelacanth fish. I, did a, or I wrote a paper on coelacanth in third grade. grade. Okay. Uh, okay, third grade. All right. Yeah. That's because you were playing Animal Crossing. <laughs> don't lie. It didn't exist in third grade. <laughs> I don't see um, an, another thing is, um, with this whole like mutations are bad thing, like most mutations are bad. That actually, that makes no sense in, uh, in terms of like conservation. So do you know what, so, have you ever looked into like conservation efforts where like we try to rescue a species that is on the brink of extinction? Mm -hmm. Do you know what they, do you know, like from a genetics perspective, what they, what they look for, or what they try to do? Not Ooh. specifically, no. That was probably an extremely vague uh, and bad question. But they they try to get the most genetic diversity that they can. And in fact, in the wild, mm. populations are assessed. They're, they're basically like score for whether or not they are in danger of going extinct is not actually, it's not solely based on how many of them there are. Because some organisms, there just aren't very many of them, like Texas cave salamanders. But they're not in danger of going extinct because what they look for is genetic diversity. So conservationists know that genetic diversity is good, but genetic diversity is only possible because of mutations. You have to have changes uh, in order to even have that. If, if genetic entropy is true, it uh, and we have to uh, we have to take the the entire theory, which includes the assumption that most mutations are harmful. If genetic entropy were true, then inbreeding should be the best possible survival mechanism. Because what that means is genetic entropy supposes we started with some sort of pure genome and it keeps getting corrupted through mutations and whatever over time. So I would I say, guess, well, go ahead, Brandon. Okay, well, I guess I don't know enough on the effects of um, inbreeding <clears throat> to really comment exactly on what it does. Um, but I would say that, so you're presupposing that the complexity in the gene code is available because of mutations? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. Because that's something, and you, if, if you watch the debate with Cease and the Omnist, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, I forget her name too. Um, We're sorry. I, you know, sorry. yes, I know. <laughs> Especially if you're Artemis. Watching. Artemis. 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 Oh. Okay. That's right. Yes. Um, that one of the things that we said was that uh, there's no evidence to say that you can actually gain information in the gene code uh, sustainably over a period of time. And that's kind of like our big thing. And that's when you get into the whole discussion between micro and macro evolution, you know, that we have all this evidence that you can down select the gene code, you know, and I always use this example all the time just because it's fresh in my mind. But to get from wolf to Pomeranian, you know, that's a big down select in gene <clears> code. Um, but you can't do you can't show evidence that we had to gain a whole lot of information, which is what you would need to get from very, very simple single celled organisms to what we have today. You know, so um, I, I, I think so I would what disagree with that. Did, yeah, right, right. You'd have to in order to believe in evolution. But oh, it's no, just, I mean, I mean, I, that you, I have evidence. Uh, to the OK, contrary. and that we should get to that, too. But it seemed earlier you said that uh, these mutations are. Um, uh, it, maybe I misheard you, but you, you were saying that they were there are beneficial mutations um, to go against Sanford's work because we have a very diverse gene code which would then be assuming the consequent where that's the very thing we're debating. Yeah. You, you have to have genetic diversity in a population or else it runs the risk of going extinct. Yes. So we believe that all of the organisms that God made through special creation on creation week had very high levels of genetic uh, complexity. Right. Um, and that a lot of diversity and that over time, um, through natural selection, they are, uh, it's down selected. And so you actually lose complexity over So time. you think that the, okay, that's, that's interesting to me, to me, that doesn't make it, it depends on the organism, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because we have recombination, right? I, I will only pass down half of my genes. Um, and if I 
if I ever have a kid and my partner would only pass down half of hers. Right. So, um, and there would be, I mean, if there are, I mean, if mutations happen, then that means that the, that the genome can't ever, so th this is weird. I don't see how you could have uh, your, your population genetics at the time of creation. And then if mutations are random changes, I, but we have non-random selection, I don't see how that could make the genome more simple. Um, that, that would be something, uh, seeing a, an experiment to, to verify that would be extremely interesting. I, okay. I okay. Th I mean, we've, I mean, we've allowed, you know, bacteria to reproduce for th tens of thousands of generations. And, and I know their, their genomes have been sequenced. Um, but, um, I wouldn't, I don't know anything about any measurements of the overall complexity of the genome. Well, um, head. maybe a way to kind of measure this is, and, uh, is when you look at phenotypes, you know, I'm not very educated on certain details in the genome. I will admit that. But when you look at things like what Adam mentioned earlier on the long hair and short hair dogs, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, genetics does show if you have a, uh, I don't know, really cold, um, environment move in to where all of the dogs <laughs> with short hair can't survive anymore. Um, now you've killed them off. And so that the gene code through natural selection now only contains information for long haired dogs. Um, you actually it, can't it, breed backwards. You now have lost the ability to breed backwards. Would you agree with that statement to where you can get back to short hair dogs? Not a hundred percent. So what I would say is, you know, for any population, there's, there's going to be variation. It's, it's not impossible, but it, but it's pretty rare that an allele would go completely extinct from the genome. Uh, you're always going to have some variation. Like, you know about the, the black and white peppered moths in England during mm -hmm. the Industrial Revolution? So the, the black moths all of a sudden became way more popular, but the white moths never went away, even though their, their um, fitness decreased dramatically in the environment. And then when the pollution went away, they came back, right? So... I, I agree that you couldn't breed back. Well, I also don't agree with this exactly. You couldn't breed back the allele that you lost, but you can regain traits. Um, so I, I think partially we have like, a, I, I don't agree exactly with the framing that like the, the short hairs completely go away. That can happen. I it's not super common from what I understand, but also there are traits that you can get back. I, I know of a really, cool experiment with uh bacteria that that's related to that that we can talk about later okay okay but with the moth example that you brought up um it never actually lost the white allele is that what you stated and that later yeah. the white allele came back in the whole population in yeah it got it got really rare but it never disappeared okay. you know yeah, like albino would... albino animals they never well the the genes for it never go away because but is that albinism with those moths? Is that albinism or is no? That I was just I was just drawing oh, a comparison. Okay. Like we never okay. see albino animals, but the alleles for it are in the genome. It's it's recessive, so you'll only see it if you get a particularly unlucky, depending on your on on the way you're looking at it, uh, inheritance. But okay. but it never goes away. It, there can be no individuals that are expressing this through their phenotype, but it can okay. still be there. But that's a mutation that can come up at any time, right? That's not like a specific. This gene isn't that really a mutation, so much, right? Yeah, albinism isn't really a mutation. I, well, I mean, you don't get that's... albinism from a mutation. Uh, you get sickle cell, or you can get leukemia from a mutation. But albinism, you are born with. You inherit it. Yes, but you okay. But you still inherit it, I thought, as a mutation. It's not as, well, you, know, it, you know, where all of your cells are not producing the melatonin they should be. Mel yeah, mel flip. Melanin. 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 I almost said melatonin. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> are you tired? <laughs> That's a different problem. No, I know. No, I'm not tired enough. That's the problem. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. So, uh, let's see. So, the moth example would be more analogous if – all of the white moths were annihilated because the industrial revolution, it would be something like that. You know, then I would say, can you then get them back? And, you know, um, 
You could mm. theoretically, but continue. so like you know, like I believe you can't breed back from uh, like poodles to a, a dog that now can uh, their hair stops growing. You know, because that's one thing with poodles is that their hair never stops growing. So like uh, they can't actually survive in the wild because there's nobody there to clip their hair. So that eventually it'll get long yeah, like enough she... to where they, they can't move. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like, uh, so um, is there any way to then, do we have any evidence that would say that we could then breed back to get to, we can to a more survivable form of like a poodle, you know, that's what I, I guess I'm saying. here. So I, I think we do. Um, okay. So, the, this is actually what I was talking about just a little bit ago. Um, I, I don't remember. It, I read this in a book by Jerry Coyne. Uh, it's probably a book you've heard of. It's called Why Evolution is True. But um, I, I don't know the name of the study or the authors, but it's talked about in there. I could I could get it later and, and let you know. But what they did was they took bacteria, and we can we can do genetic editing of bacteria. We've been, we've been doing that for a long time. We can make them do what we want them to do. Or, or not do what we want them to do. So what they specifically did was they removed the genes from these bacteria that allow them to digest lactose, right? So they made lactose intolerant bacteria, which is pretty funny. Now, um, most traits are polygenic, meaning like there's no gene. For, when you learn about Mendelian inheritance, you learn that Mendel, it's insane how lucky he got. All of the traits he studied were controlled by one gene, which that is not the way most genes work. In humans, there's no such thing as a gene for height. They've done genome-wide association analyses of people, and they found that the most significant gene accounts for about one two hundredth of your height. It's crazy. So it's the it's the interplay of many genes. Most of our traits are, but with the with the bacteria, we know the gene for uh, digesting lactose. <clears throat> Anyways, they deleted it. Um, now bacteria can metabolize, they can digest other carbohydrates, right? They, they get most of their energy from glucose. I'm pretty sure it's just that they can metabolize lactose too, but now these ones couldn't. And what they did is they just allowed these bacteria to reproduce, uh, in a, you know, in a flask or Petri dish, whatever in water. And they would, they had lactose in there, but it was an unavailable resource to them because they couldn't digest it. It'd be like, if I, if I took you to oh, like a salad bar, and there was wood at the salad bar along with regular food. Well, you're not a termite, so you can't use the wood, right? Um, what they found was eventually the bacteria re-evolved, or I, I shouldn't say re-evolved, but they evolved the ability to digest lactose again. Now, they did not re-evolve the gene that they deleted because that's just, it's not impossible, but there are so many zeros that we can just say it's impossible, right? Um, oh. But there's more than one way to skin a cat, for lack of a better catchphrase, right? So they they ended up, it was probably changes in different genes. It, it's probably not a brand new gene hmm. that all of a sudden evolved, but a change in other genes that interact in complex ways that eventually gave them a metabolic pathway to digest lactose again. Highly, so highly right, interesting. Okay. You're right that we can't breed back like specific things. Like when an animal goes extinct, we can't take its closest living relative and then breed them to the point where we get the other animal back. You know, even if we bred them to the point where they are physically indistinguishable from the extinct thing, it still wouldn't be them because every organism is the result of its own unique evolutionary pathway uh, through its own descendants. And if we're breeding its most, its closest living relative, then that means it can never be that organism. We could just make it look exactly like it. Isn't it okay. for, for like lactose though? Cause I, I from what I've learned, um, we 2000 years ago, something like that, we couldn't drink cow's milk. Uh, we, we, a lot of get, people still can't. Yeah. They get like this. And so the, the reason we can is because of a genetic mutation that allows us to drink lactose. So mm -hmm. if we had two, lactose intolerant parents mother and father right it, wouldn't it just kind of be almost for lack of a better term the luck of the draw that the child may not have the same thing um yes well I'm, I'm actually confused what your question is 
Like, like are you I, asking where did lactose tolerance in humans come from? No, I'm I'm just saying like so it, they the child may not have that or may have the mutation to be able to process lactose, um, and so in this instance, that would be. I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't have to necessarily breed a certain way. Like it could be you could get lucky and two breeding sessions of the bacteria, you'll get the result that you're looking for, or it could take a hundred. There's not, there's some like uncontrollables in there that just happen to, to work either for or against your favor. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Even if the bacteria never evolved the ability to digest lactose again, that wouldn't mean that they would be forever doomed or anything like that. Because there are multiple ways for organisms to be successful. I, I mean, we know this because you go up to any ecosystem and there are multitudes of different living things all playing the game of life in different ways. And there are multitudes of different um, uh, organisms that are just subspecies of each other. In that in that same ecosystem, living out different niches. Okay. Well, hold on. You mentioned something interesting when you explained that experiment with the bacteria. Um, first of all, that is really interesting that they were able to get that ability back to digest lactose. But then you said something interesting. It wasn't by resurrecting that old gene. It was through some other mechanism that's already in place. It was, okay. it was through mutations in genes, but not the not the somehow serendipitous reacquisition of the gene that they deleted. Okay, okay. So it was a new so mutation then, that gave them the same the, the, probably the goal. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. okay. But then that would still show that you know you can't. Um, well, it would show that it would be hard to. Well, you're you're admitting you can't breed backwards and regain information that was lost, I guess in the same way is what you're admitting. Maybe in a new way. Yeah. Yeah, it, okay. it also okay. it would also make no sense to do that because uh, again, the only way for organisms to continue to be able to exist and be successful is for change, is for there to be variation in the population and that variation to guide reproduction because the environment's like always going to change. So there's like, there's no reason that evolution or natural selection would ever want to revert. Now there are, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it is a fact well, that it, or it's a, uh, what would be an example? Like, you know, there've been several ice ages. Um, so, you know, earth went from glacial maximums to it all melted and then glacial maximums came back. So it's like, well, wait, the, the old environment is back. Let's breed backwards. Well, it, it just unfortunately doesn't work that way with, with evolution because the, the, the alleles for or the, yeah, the, I guess we could say the alleles for the genetic combinations or whatever for that to have good fitness during an ice age disappeared when the ice age was, was gone. So, but I mean, you know, there are some things that can go back and forth, like the peppered moths. I mean, we could get, we, we could revert back to, but those never went extinct. So I'm rambling. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. No, no worries. Um, now, I will say we do not uh, believe in multiple glacial maximums. We believe there was one after the flood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I figured. The I didn't generation. want to use that as an yeah. example for that reason. That's okay. But I, but I couldn't think of anything else. Okay. But um, still, that would that would just mean that by saying that they couldn't uh, go backwards, I'm not saying evolution would want to do that. Or, you know, if we personify evolution, you know, or natural selection would go that way. But that just means there was a loss of information. And if there's a loss of information, well, that, that's what I'm saying is how you characterize microevolution is is a loss in information. And and you don't just have little increases in information to get macroevolution or, you know, to get from single celled organism to a horse. You you have to have a large addition of information that happens consistently over a very long period of time. You know, it's it's not just um, you know. I mean, we have evidence that a mutation, we can have a couple mutations that will bring back some kind of capability that was lost, but we would need evidence that that can happen on a gigantic scale. We're not just getting back lactose capability. We're getting a new arm, you know, <clears throat> that kind of thing. That That's what makes it hard for us to fully believe that evolution is practical um, or because it's not observable and all we see are these little changes. And then we have evidence, like you just mentioned, that you lose genes 
but we don't see so, a gain in large amounts of genetic information. That that's what I'm saying. So I, I would argue against that for two reasons. One, mm -hmm. um, you can there are alleles that can be lost. Um, uh, I'm not I'm not aware of any genes like entire genes. I mean, it it can happen. I know it can happen because you can during during crossing over and recombination, not all of the the genes can be passed on because the chromosomes will not equally swap information. So you can lose genes that way, I guess. But even if like an allele is lost, well, you can regain new traits, right? So yeah, we are talking about, it is, I'm not saying that, I'm not even saying you're wrong. Yes, you can lose genetic information, but you can always gain new genetic information. And that's kind of the other thing you're saying. We don't, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you said we don't have evidence of it, but I think we do have evidence of of new genetic information. So usually when I talk about this, people kind of say, yeah, but well, we'll get into that in a second. So myriapods like um, uh, centipedes and millipedes and uh, crustaceans. So that would be like lobsters, crabs and shrimp. Those are <clears throat> so these are all arthropods, right? They have an exoskeleton and segmented bodies, right? The reason that um, crustaceans have most of them, I think, are decapods. They have five pairs of legs, whereas insects only have three, is because crustaceans have more copies of the Hox genes that control for uh, limb development. So that is an example of additional information. Now, people typically say, but if, but duplication of, I mean, we know chromosomal duplications happen, um, but duplications of pre-existing genes is not new information. It's just, it, it's, it's a copy of pre-existing information. But uh, clearly with crustaceans, the the copies of those genes have now been altered because they have, uh, the, like they have the claws in the front, for example. And arachnids have eight pairs of legs, but then they also have these weird things in the front. I can't remember what they're called. They have a really cool Just name. call them their fangs or what, their fangs. whatever. No, not the, it's the creepy looking things. Oh, so the things their, that open up on the, yeah. Yeah, they okay. have their fangs and then they have these yeah. other things which are right next to it. I, I can't remember what they're called. So I think those are examples. Um, there are genes that humans have that we have more than one copy of. Um, I tried to do a quick chat GPT search. It only gave me one <laughs> result. Um, I was pretty, I'm pretty sure we have more than one copy of uh, this this gene that codes for vitamin C, but this is just giving me some ribosomal RNA gene. I don't, know, I don't care, I guess. But so that's my response to you can't get new genetic information. I would argue that you can, and I and I think we have good evidence to say that you can by um, the duplication by duplication of what's already there. But yes. that wouldn't. I so uh, Brendan was more getting at like. It would take more than duplication to go from a single cell organism to us or to, to you know, something of that, you know, scale, something, you know, it, you're going to have well, to duplicate it. You can't just duplicate what you already have as a single cell to, to get to us. There, there has to be more. I agree. You can't just do that. But again, the du what the duplications do is they allow for, you know, more than one copy of a gene, but then you don't necessarily need more than one copy of a gene and changes can happen in genes that have been duplicated and then it can be repurposed for something new. Uh, like the, uh, I, I don't think a duplication is what made the bacteria be able to redigest lactose, but we can see that changes in pre-existing genes can lead to uh, new characteristics. No, clearly there's evidence of new characteristics that can form um, maybe even through some other pathway, like with the bacteria that that's, that's very interesting, but then that is, seems to be a different thing to say that that can happen, um, to say that you can gain large amounts of genetic information, you know, it, it have to be, and we, of course you could always say this, well, that takes millions of years. We can't observe that. Then what we'd have to say is, well, is there some smaller, uh, form of that that we can observe that we would know this could then build on itself and we can get a whole thing um and because uh you know a the natural selection that we do observe is 
the opposite direction. It just the evidence that is usually used, the evidence that's usually used in support of evolution, macroevolution is is wanting because all of that evidence is subtraction. But you are saying that there are some addition of some what things. Do you mean, what do you mean? I by guess I would have to lose. I would have to look into that. Um, like when we're talking about, uh, well, you admitted that you lose some genes and like in those that bacteria. So when they got the ability to digest lactose again, it was not by getting that old gene back. And so that just means in moving in that direction, they, they lost genetic information is what I'm saying. Well, we um, forced it upon them, but I, I would argue that, <clears throat> yeah. Well, first thing well is we, then we what you're them. arguing, what you're arguing then is that, you know, that hypothetical situation that we're thinking of, which has happened before, you know, where the short hair dog gene is removed because mm -hmm. or the phenotype is removed because of the environment change mm -hmm. you're arguing you you can go all the way back you can get the whole thing again and and that's not so much of shouldn't be thought of as a retroactive uh action in the gene code but it's more of um just for survivability sake i mean if it gets warmer outside again you hope that gene is still there so that they can then lose the long hair or or, or else go extinct yeah so I will, we've kind of drifted. I feel like we're, we're kind of still on, but we're kind of drifting away from the initial issue. And so the initial Genetic issue was, entropy. yeah. Oh, Can yeah, you hear I, me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, that genetic entropy and, and natural selection kind of clash. So oh, yeah, I, I can go um, back to that. I'm happy. Well, no, no, no. The reason I was saying this is because, so this was an objection actually that Dr. Stephen Sch Schaffner um, he's a, po a population geneticist and computational biologist at MIT and Harvard. Um, and he brought this up to Sanford. Uh, this, this was his response. So Sanford said, they have not carefully thought through what they're saying. The nature of near neutral mutations is such that they are not only unselectable due to environmental noise, but they are also unselectable because they are noise to each other. Thus, as the number of neutral mutations accumulate, selection gets worse, not better. So if an individual carries just one near neutral mutation, it may be very weakly selectable, but probably not as environmental noise will override its tiny effect. So there will be little or no selection at all. If each individual has a 10, has 10,000 near neutral selections uh, or selection, not selections, has to try and select for or select against all 10,000 conflicting mutational fitness effects. Simultaneously, 10,000 independent mutational fitness effects, usually bad ones, vanishingly, blot, uh, vanishingly few good, will not be pulling, will not just be pulling in different directions with each other. They will act as noise, blotting out the fitness effects of each other. Haldane makes it clear that only a few mutations can be effectively selected simultaneously or for simultaneously. Trying to select for too many mutations at once totally overwhelms any type of selection. Indeed, selection interference not only prevents selection for countless near neutrals, it interferes with selection for more impactful mutations that are also accumulating. And so that is a way, way, way more eloquent, eloquently spoken version of what I was trying to get across <laughs> was that. Yeah. Um, what do you, what is, what is your response to that? I guess I, I know there's a lot because that was too much information. I know um, <laughs> I, 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 need, I need to read that. And uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that. Um, okay. it, it, it was just too much. I was trying to think I of, know. okay. What does this mean? What does that mean? What does it mean? And I put it in the comments if you want to pull it up sorry. and save it for the next time. Because that that is a lot. I was as I was reading, I was like, oh, this is this is a lot. <laughs> this yeah, is that's, that's not to say that's not like good information or anything like that. I just uh in real time, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just, same, same. Be, because I'm that, oh, sorry. Well, I was just saying because that was the that's literally one of the things that an, an MIT professor brought up. I'm like, okay, this is you know, good question, obviously. So let's see what Sanford says. And so I, I, I would, you know, I think that that's, I, I think that's a good response. It's a way better way of saying it than I was trying to say it. I've got the, uh, yeah. I opened up the link here, so I'll, I'll take a look at that. Um, 
that when we're done or maybe maybe tomorrow i don't know um yeah so j going back to genetic entropy um so I, again if you feel like i'm talking about the same thing too many times that's fine because i have tons of other notes that we can talk about but i genetic entropy neglects I feel like it neglects the idea of beneficial mutations because it asserts that most of them are harmful, but it, it, it's just weird because I feel like your guys's worldview asserts that beneficial mutations must happen because I mean, the only way for species to have radiated after the flood, for example, would be for genetic diversity to exist among the population and then for natural selection to weed out those with poor fitness or whatever. But there's also experimental proof to back this up. So if you, uh, these, well, oh shoot. Um, let me open up the, uh, I closed out of your live stream. I'll type this in the comments because <laughs> this, this is a resource okay. you can look into. I don't have the, I don't have the name of the paper, but I, the authors have really unique names. So Raphael, San Juan, Andres Moya, and Santiago Elena. Um, and I don't know what the name of their paper was, but if, if you search up, um, it's, oh, it's called a mutation induction experiment. So they, they did this with viruses. So they, they actually just forced viruses to get mutations. I'm not sure if they did that, like with a, you, you can use like a like a neutron gun to do that you, you can bombard dna and force it or you can just subject it to radiation uh norman borlaug used to do that with wheat uh in the early 20th centuries uh nobody knows who norman borlaug is and it's a crime because he's an yeah, amazing humanitarian I've never heard of him. uh he th there's a really amazing book about his life called the wizard and the prophet by charles mann uh you got to read it he norman borlaug basically Two billion people exist because of him. He was a he was a green he was a green revolutionist for agriculture, which sounds like you're into like new age, like good for the environment. But no, he he pushed like um, the use of pesticides and fertilizers and irrigation techniques into the developing world, and rescued countless people. And he, he also was a very intense selective breeder with crops. Anyways, I'm sorry. How do you spell Borlaug, by the way? B o it's pretty much just like it sounds. B o r l a u g bore log yeah norman he's from iowa he's one of those good old boys <laughs> so anyways actually that sounds like the south so i don't know why i said that i'm from the midwest originally so uh -oh. um sorry for that but um in this so they forced mutations in viruses um in completely random locations throughout the i don't know if it was just rna or just dna or both um but what they basically the simple of it is they found that some of those mutations increased fitness, right? Um, a lot of them, and these were completely randomly interjected mutations done in a very unnatural way as well. Uh, quite a lot of them were negative, but some were beneficial. And so it's just to counter uh, Sanford's claim that most mutations are harmful. So I think one of the, the things like, for example, you could look at the cave fish. And over time, natural selection to, or um, its genetic mutation, along with natural selection, took away its ability to see. It lost its, its ability for sight. So this would be a loss of ability. But in this case, it was beneficial because the other senses increased and it's in a cave. So you can't see anyways. It's dark. And so now it's hearing, it's smell, it's taste, everything else increased. So that would be an example of losing something which would be beneficial, but, but I, I still, gene, but not necessarily a gene. Um, so they lost, they lost an ability, but they're not necessarily, th this is different than equating it to a loss of genetic information because, um, well, they lost the genetic information <clears throat> to properly see as a cave fish because those cave fish but now they, are always blind when they're, breeding. yeah, but they, they still probably have the genes for it. It's like, for example, in humans, um, where do I have this? I have this on here somewhere. Um, we have the gene for making vitamin C. Um, it's just that it has mutated to the point where it makes all the precursor molecules. There's just an enzyme at the very end that we no longer make properly. 
And so our bodies can't make vitamin C because of that. But we actually have the genes for it, right? So a, a loss of function does not automatically equal a loss of genetic information. It actually might be, a, I don't know, on a case-by-case -case basis, I admit, I have no idea. But it's totally possible that you can add a nucleotide to a gene, uh, and that makes the gene not function anymore. So this, but this would still kind of fall under a loss of ability through, I would say that was, that would be like, it would be fair to say that's a genetic mutation because a natural selection worked it's, with it. Yeah. But it's not a loss of genetic information because that, that's how it was framed originally. That was my only point. Well, it's a loss of the, the non mutated form of that gene to allow them to have sight. Or does, does that yeah, not but sound the gene is, is still there because we're talking about the preservation of the genome. Um, and we haven't necessarily lost anything from the genome. In fact, it may have been added to, um, or if you just substitute, or, or it could have been substituted. Like if you, if you, I'm pretty sure sick, yeah, sickle cell anemia is caused by one single nucleotide in our entire three and a half billion nucleotide sequence in all of our cells. A substitution of just one single nucleotide causes sickle cell anemia, right? So we lose, we don't lose the ability to have red blood cells, but their shape is corrupted by that. And it's through a simple substitution. So nothing's really lost or gained. Swap one thing for another. So all I'm talking about is I, I just, I don't agree with the framing that a loss of a trait means a loss of genetic information. Necessarily. It, right, it could not be that, but it not necessarily. Yeah, it can. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> hey, man, that's that's pretty interesting. I definitely need to look into that more. I have to admit. Um, the the next thing I wrote down was so Sanford's idea is that there was an the like there was a, an original genome free of mutations. Yeah, but so mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Right. Yeah. Um. <sighs> So this this might be really hard, and I did not write I did not write down the author for for this. But if you look up um, Stickle, ah oh shoot, I didn't write down the authors for this uh, for this research. But it's with stickleback fish, which live in like Washington State, Oregon State, I think. Um, oh. I don't know. If I, I typed it in the chat. You may be able to find it. I'm not sure exactly what to type in, but we do. This might not make good sense for me to explain. It may just be too much information, not enough visuals, but they do these genome analyses um, that show that the genes that organisms have um, are, <clears throat> they come from a wide variety of haplotypes and a, a haplotype is just a group of inherited alleles. So like your haplotype is your mom and your dad because uh, you, you inherited exactly two chunks of, of DNA from them, right? So haplotypes and haplogroups are something that like population geneticists, especially when discussing human evolution use um, to refer to like different groups of, of populations of people. We can do it with populations of any organism. So if you if you look at the genome of these of these sticklebacks, um, and this is not a genome, but whatever. When when we look at genomes, it's typically like you see this linear thing, and then they mark the different genes on it, right? So what they do is they graph based on, well, I, I don't remember how they graph this if it's based on like molecular clock data or whatever. But what you find is. I'm trying to draw a picture. I'm, I'm using my inner, I'm channeling my inner teacher and using a whiteboard here. So <laughs> this, this graph would be, um, we are, we are graphing the timeline of when that gene or cluster of genes was inherited. So when did that particular haplogroup, a haplogroup again, is just a cluster of, of alleles or whatever that you inherit. Where did it come from? What we find is it looks like an EKG, right? If your EKG looks like this, you might be in trouble, but it kind of resembles an EKG. Whereas if genetic entropy is true, if, if all of us only a few thousand years ago are the stock from like an ancestral population that was already like pre-programmed with a, a more pure genome, then 
Now, where should I draw this? Then the graph should look like this. I didn't do a very good job of drawing a super straight line, but it should be again. It's it's time. It's more time up. So on the on the y axis, uh, the okay. past is up and the present is is down. It should look more like this. The vast majority of now mutations can happen later on down the road, but it it should look. The prediction is it should look like this. The vast majority of all of our uh, haplogroups the, these gene clusters that we inherit should be from the ancestral population with some changes occurring uh, along the way. Because again, in this worldview, Earth is uh, pretty young and there haven't been very many generations. Again, I'm not a... Okay, so the why... my thing and Stats aren't my thing, so I couldn't, I probably couldn't unpack that a whole lot more, but it, go ahead. Well, that was interesting. Um, you, you, the why is... Give me one second, guys. I'll be right back. Okay. That's cool. Um, the Y axis is time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the X is what again? It's just it's, different haplogroups. It, it's the entire genome, basically. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's just these, these that we've just mapped the genes along the X axis. Yeah. And then a haplogroup would just be like these individual clusters. Oh, okay. 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 Um, so when you have a bump or a dip on that line, that that signifies and like all right when it, the it line goes horizontal uh, and then it dips it yeah. gets older because it goes greater on the y-axis when it when it dips down it's it's more recent when it dips down oh, so okay. like for example, oh, oh i'm sorry that's your orientation okay so it gets younger and then yeah. younger like for example with lactose tolerance um a lot of people don't have it some people do so the the idea is that the idea is that we didn't start with lactose tolerance and then some people unfortunately uh lost the ability to digest milk it's the other way around so the so that haplogroup the cluster of genes that allow us to digest milk uh would be a recent thing so it would be a downward bump on this so we would find the genes for that and when we find when they were inherited it's closer to the present day whereas the rest of the, the vast majority of the other genes in the distant past. Okay, so what you're saying is we have evidence that we can <clears throat> add abilities that we used to not have before, right? Or um, you could I say abilities, you could say... I wouldn't say that was the point of that. The, the point is just to look at the genome and when have... when What was the timeline of the inheritance of those, of those genes, of, of those clusters of genes, the haplotypes? And it, it... When you look at it, again, it looks like an EKG. If we had genetic entropy, then we should expect to see the vast majority of all of the groups of genes that we have would be from, it would be pretty much a flat line almost all the way through the, the analysis with some downward ticks. I, I mean, I'm still having trouble understanding this that. would be, this would yeah, be, I should have, you know, this would be something that would have been more helpful if I looked into that study prior um, but this, so basically because the trend is more, it's, it's kind of like not random, it, it, random. Okay. We could use that word as opposed to steady decline. It kind of, there's the issue, the, the yeah, contradiction like, almost. Me, me, I think I have a good way to put it. Like, it, like with dog breeding, like if you have a pure breed, right? Like, let's say there's this, this pure breed of dog that originally comes from the Netherlands and it, it's being still being bred today well if you wanted to know if your dog is a purebred um from that or just simply looks like it or is like a mutt or whatever if you wanted to know the the, the purity of your dog and whether or not it, it it's a pure breed from that original one you'd want to do this kind of analysis and if you find that the vast majority of all of its um the the, the timeline for the vast majority of all of its gene clusters are specifically from when we know that that dog breed in the Netherlands uh, appeared, then you would have confirming data that says, yes, what you have in the present is ancestral stock from this group in that specific place right there. But if it was all over the place, then that would be evidence of, well, maybe it's great, 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 great grand puppy was from there. But along the way, a bunch of its uh, offspring and 
great grandchildren and whatever mixed with other breeds. Okay. So essentially with that data, and again, I have to look at this, this kind study of a here. Purity test. That's that's really kind of what yeah. it is. So what what it should show, you're saying with yeah. genetic entropy. This is, is genetic that... purity. Yeah. Whereas this okay. is not. Top one is not. Hmm. Wait, wait, which one's genetic purity? Say it the again. One that's the, more, the one that's more flat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. But that would be the genetic entropy one as well. That would that should represent genetic entropy. Or are you just saying that in a, yes, in a different that's, sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. But and again, I well, well, never mind. So well, does that but does that trend still show that the mutations are are growing? Like it's not as if there are less mutations on that scale, or or is it showing that there are less mutations that, that it's fixing itself as opposed to mutating? Um I'm not I'm not totally sure what you mean. To me, what it says is that what this particular population is inheriting is a great number of of very slightly different clusters of genes. And the only reason that you can get that is from just like natural variation within the breeding population uh, that arises from mutations. That's, that's the only way you can get genetic variation, really. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying is like, I, I don't know how many generations of these fish that they have, you know, if they have five to one generation of these fish you know with fish they repopulate pretty quickly and usually with animals like that you could do something i know with bacteria they repopulate every day so yeah, it, you can them, yeah. yeah so it's you could, every 30 minutes yeah right yeah. so you could use multiple generations to do this test and so i guess what i'm wondering is how many generations did they do this test of did let's say there's parent fish uh, one, and then they have the next set of kids, which is the fish set two, and then three. And that's three it generations. It does tell you, but I don't remember. I'm I'm almost okay. certain it does tell you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to type in either. I I could find it. I got it. I actually got the study from a video I watched where they reference it. Um, okay. so I, I could get it to you later, but we have yeah. We send have that. To yeah, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> send that to me. We'll 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 have to get back to that because i'd be interested to take a look at that i haven't heard of this i haven't even heard of a stickleback fish let alone this study so yeah, there, there, <laughs> there's a couple of evolution uh studies that have been done on them I, I can't remember what the heck the other one was um the next thing i want to talk about is this got brought up earlier but they're called compensatory mutations i couldn't remember what the heck the word was so that just means um uh the, the word there is like compensate right so um even if so even if we take Sanford, um, if, if we take the idea of harmful mutations seriously, even if there are harmful mutations, that doesn't necessarily, that isn't necessarily a, a nail in the coffin for natural selection because there can be compensatory mutations. So what these are is these are mutations that restore or improve the function of a gene. So you won't, you won't get, we talked about this earlier, you won't get the gene back um, in the example with the bacteria earlier, that was different genes changing. So we can't get the original one back, but um, other genes, mutations in other genes can help restore the original function of a gene that is mutated to the point where it's maladaptive, meaning it, it harms it. And there's, a, there's an experiment for this. So um, I will, again, authors with weird names, so I'll type it in. Um, mice... Meisner Patton at all 2002. And it's a. Uh, sorry. And they studied Salmonella bacteria. So what they did was <clears throat> um, bacteria can, can develop antibiotic resistance. Oh, I've seen this study. Is this the one with E. coli or H. pylori? No, this one is with Salmonella. I, I heard of some resources or okay. some studies that studied E. coli, but this one doesn't. Now, they may be studying the same thing, but this one isn't that. So uh, they're studying Salmonella, and what they they found was this: the Salmonella bacteria does have antibiotic resistance to streptomycin, um, but the, there's a there's a cost benefit ratio here. They are resistant to streptomycin, 
but they have reduced ability to reproduce amino acids. And so therefore these ones, the ones that are resistant to antibi or uh, that are antibiotic resistant, don't reproduce as fast as the ones that don't have it, right? So they have, there is an additional, there's a benefit, but there's a trade-off too. But what's really cool is they found, um, this is just directly from the abstract, because most scientific articles, you can't get access to the whole thing unless you pay like a Yeah, right. right. I, I put this one on. I think this one you can because it's National Library of Medicine. Well, oh, that's cool. It, you, you should, yeah, I, all the links I've clicked on within are pulling it up. Um, why well, I see the abstract and I see similar articles. Well, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a look at this one, but um, <clears throat> this this is the one I'm I'm read up on. But okay, I'll just quote the authors. Only four of the 81 evolved lineages contained streptomycin sensitive revertants. So, um, and that's what, resistance. Yeah. So what they did okay. was they they had 81 different lineages that that have. They're resistant to streptomycin, but they don't reproduce as quickly. So what they did was they had 81 separate groups just continue to uh, reproduce over and over and over again, like the Richard Lenski experiment. Um, so four of them did revert back to uh, being susceptible to streptomycin. So th that's not exactly good. <laughs> they kind of lost function, basically, but only four out of 81. Um, all the rest, the 77 remaining contained mutants that were still fully streptomycin resistant, had retained the original resistance mutation, and also acquired compensatory mutations. So most of those com compensatory mutations resulting in at least 35 different amino acid substitutions were new single nucleotide substitutions. So the results show that the the deleterious effects of a resistant mutation can be compensated by an unexpected variety of mutations. So in like human speak, not, not science jargon, they, they, they found that new mutations happened and really simple ones, single nucleotide uh, substitutions, I believe is, yeah. Um, really simple mutations happened that uh, uh, gave them, they gained back their original uh, fitness measurement so basically the ability to reproduce at the original rate was was regained in 77 out of those 81 lineages so that's crazy because that's the opposite of what happened with i mean h fluoride of course is a different virus mm -hmm. or a different bacteria and i th i don't know if the same thing happened with e coli but with h fluoride the it, uh, antibiotic resistance, the certain mutation would allow it to survive the antibiotics because normally when it, you would take the antibiotics, the H. pylori would produce this poison, which then kills it. And then this mutation didn't allow that to happen. That, you know, For lack of a better term, you have the, the area where the, the antibiotic would go into and it was too small, it wouldn't fit in there. So it avoided making the poison to kill itself, but it wasn't able to reproduce. And so it... it ended up dying um and that was specifically with h pluri so that's the, i'll have to look into this one that's that's interesting well that um, one is a um a deficit that caused it to be resistant to the antibiotic it's the yeah. port um the one through the, one, the bacteria the one adam takes, mentioned is yes yes for h pluri h pluri um yeah it, because the port of entry for any nutrients for the bacterium is smaller so it actually can't take in some nutrients which is why it's just unhealthy in general but then yeah. uh also because that port is smaller it can't take in antibiotics the poison and so um yes it's survivable there but it's because of a loss of information you know yeah. um but you're saying in this instance there was this compensatory if i said that right gene that allowed it to gain um to it, lose resistance it, it could to reproduce as fast as it could before that's what happened while keeping resistance to streptomycin. Yeah. 77 out of the 81 remained or, or retained their resistance and okay. gained back. And for uh, lost. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, this compensatory gene is compensatory. I'm saying this weird, but is uh, something that was just already inside of salmonella that gave it the capability to do this. No, cause they didn't have it at first. Um, it, it was mutations in 
probably pre-existing genes. Um, or, or it could have been, I mean, it, it may actually not even be, I mean, they say it, well, they, they know for a fact that it's mutations because they, they specifically list these amino acid substitutions, but it, it could be changes in, well, I don't know if bacteria have epigenetics or not. I think they do. I think they yeah, have I mean, if they have DNA, so. then they would have to have epigenetics. If they have cells well, they, in them, then they have but to they, but they have to have But they have to have methyl methylation sites. Um, and I actually, I don't think bacteria do because they don't have histone proteins. I don't think so. Okay. I thought all um, you know, cell structures would have to go through epigenetics. Eukaryotes, yes. But actually, I don't think proka prokaryotes do. Um, but I'll, I'll look into that. But I'm almost certain that prokaryotes don't have histones. And so I don't think that, but I'm, I'm happy to be wrong about that. Um, well, th this would be another, uh, well, kind of sort of. So you really, you have to read that paper from, or that, that article I sent on the defense of genetic entropy, because this is, I think, the mutations and equilibrium refutation of genetic entropy. It's kind of like what we're getting into now. And he, he addresses this again. Yeah, this, long, has, this has Robert Carter and John Sanford in it. Yeah, well, no, that's the article with, um, that's the Responding to supposed refutations of genetic entropy from the X. You're talking oh, about Carter's the, on that? Okay, you're yeah, talking okay, about the yeah, compensatory yeah, yeah. Yes. adaptation in the, yes, oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know if I had put the other study in here either, but he does, there are four, five, junk DNA, I've heard that one before, six, he, he does quite a few reputations. Okay. He, this is luckily this has been around for long enough to where there's been enough back and forth, you know, chatter in this regard. Um, but just to say, I I can't say it better than Sanford can <laughs> the responses. So that's why I was yeah. saying it, it may be beneficial if we if you read this, read see if these are the refutations you would have, or you might find some of them to be just non substantial, um, and then and go from there sure um i only have i only have a couple other things about uh genetic entropy on uh that i wrote down on here but one of the things and this might be the thing that you take offense to is i i actually don't see any empirical evidence to back it up to the extent to which it asserts so like if if genetic entropy is true then all populations must be losing fitness unilaterally um, but they aren't because a population can't increase in size and decrease in fitness. Um, that, that really, that's pretty much impossible. Um, so like for the human population, for example, pretty sure the human population, I think it's doubled five times since about 1880, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 1880 was the first time we hit a billion. Um, so I, I, that alone, I don't see how that can work with the, assertion that genetic entropy occurs what about like you just can't have a, yeah i'm sorry both of you said something at the same time we'll go well, with what adam said well, I, I was saying medical advancements like our medical science has gone through the roof you know especially in the last 200 years so like we we can survive longer would apply to all life on the planet not just us but you brought well, up humans just as an example. It seems like yeah. there could be some other factor that's explaining why we have so many of us. Well, for humans, yes. But again, it, this would apply to all life. Okay, so yeah, you agree. True. Maybe humans isn't the best example for something that, though the population has increased, fitness. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, e even we'll if have we animals were, increased even if we were in cheating. Even if we were cheating through technology, which I, I would argue that we do. Um, and weirdly, there almost is something like genetic entropy in humans because of technology, because uh, there's no way you can argue that, that there uh, were the pop, the percent of the population that requires glasses today was the same as it was three, 4,000 years ago. Oh, L LASIK. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, those people just in the past went or like people who are type one diabetic. I mean, that was the death sentence only 50 years ago. Today, it's more common because those people can live longer. That that's sort of neither here nor there. But um, um, even if e even if we cheat with technology, we can't edit our genes yet. So you would still we would still have all these mutations pile up, 
And in, in this much time, it's really hard to me to argue that, well, you know, we have the industrial revolution, so we can combat the effects of genetic entropy. I think genetic entropy, as it's described, is way too powerful to um, be mitigated just by, you know, the kinds of technology we have. And most, most technology we, we have, we've only had for a few decades or a couple centuries. Which is well, when all of the explosion of population happened, too. It's only since uh, 1800s <clears throat> that we've actually had this exponential curve explode out. Yeah, but 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 we should see our population decrease uh, before that point. And that, that's never what happened. Before it, what point? Before the um, inflection before, and the increase? Before the hockey stick upwards, yeah. <clears throat> Why would we need to see that? Because, because because genetic our, entropy is yeah. happening. So th that's I, I think that it, for people, like I guess we'll have to address before that technology whole. jumps in, before and c causes the curve up. Well, it's, I'm not it's, saying we know exactly all the reasons for that curve to start, because you know it could just be a general uh, pax, you know, peace uh, that would cause human life to increase dramatically. You know, it well, wouldn't necessarily have to just Pax be increased Romana. technology. Yeah, like that's what I was thinking, that, or Mongolica or something like that. <clears throat> I haven't heard Pax Romana since uh, middle school social studies. That's yeah. <laughs> the, 200, the 200 years of peace in the Roman yep. Empire. Yeah. Um, well, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that 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 would attribute to it, having more peaceful, you know, we have more uh, democracies and like we're a constitutional republic, other governments that are more peaceful, less... Um, What's the term about being constant rating and it, you know it's less violence? Yeah, less, yeah, is a is a good word. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's less capital punishment for you know disobeying the government or, or or whatever, and then also like just increases in childbirth capability. Less women are dying for, for childbirth. We have That's more possibilities with fertility because we have treatments to make you fertile, even if you can't be fertile. Nutrition is better than it was 200 years ago, and in, in prior, like there are there are other things to counteract with what you would expect genetic entropy to do. Um, I don't know about animals. Uh, I'm not sure that we have like what data we have to so show how old elephants or, or tigers or whatever lived 500 years ago. Uh, I'm not sure that we, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be their lifespan. It would be their ability to reproduce would, would be constantly. Or, or even that, like what do we have yeah. that kind of data from that time ago to, to be able to compare to today for humans, we um, do, but not for animals. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think going back, going back thousands of years, I, I, I'm almost certain that we don't have, uh, population statistics on on animals, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean um, we actually do a little bit because they went extinct. Uh, so well, lots of animals yeah. actually went extinct. Now you know you yeah, could argue for, well, that's from because natural humans disasters did. almost certainly. Yeah, well, oh yeah, quite disasters. a lot from us. We we know yeah, for a fact. Yeah. That. But as far Protein. as genetic entropy, pigeons, we actually don't. Thylacines, know, uh, passenger uh, pigeons. The passenger oh, yeah. pigeon one is wild. It was the most abundant bird on the planet, and we killed all of them in something like 50 years. <laughs> like it's insane. Wow. We just shot them all to death. It was wow. Pretty sure, pretty sure it was the most numerous bird on the planet. Pretty sure. Um, wow. and yeah, it's it's just really unfortunate what we did. What I want to uh, the, the final thing about genetic entropy I want to say is um, although I think it's totally bunk, there are ways in which it is true. They're very specialized circumstances that I don't think model uh, the planet overall, the, the real world or whatever. So it, it is true that things like inbreeding and genetic bottlenecks and strong, if you have a small population, you get strong genetic drift. Um, those can cause harmful mutations to accumulate, but those things happen in situations that are totally unlike a typical ecosystem. Typical ecosystems don't have those really small numbers, but they also experience what's called gene flow. So gene flow is when somebody that's not from your population migrates to your area and introduces, uh, they're, they're still the same member of your species, but they come from a geographically unique area. So they, they introduce new genes or, or new alleles, I should say, not new genes. So, I mean, that, that happens. So it, it protects them from genetic entropy or whatever, um, as well as 
like the weeding out mechanisms of non-random mating, which we didn't talk about that at all, or sexual selection, which we didn't talk about at all. And that's fine because we've talked about a lot of things. Um, and uh, well, natural selection and a few other things. So I'm actually perfectly happy to say that something like genetic entropy happens in extremely small populations, like for example, on islands um, or with inbreeding, but that's not representative of the world in general. So, um, for example, um, I thought I wrote this down somewhere, but do you guys know that there were woolly mammoths alive when the pyramids were being built? I fully believe that. Yes. So they were on Wrangell Island. It was, it was the last place on earth that conventional science says that they existed. Where Wrangell is that? I Wrangell Island is an island between Alaska and Siberia. And like, okay. Yeah, it, it's between there. So what happened was we're, we don't know a hundred percent. Well, and I don't know, maybe, maybe their, their DNA has been sequenced. I don't know, but because they're on this tiny Island, uh, they could not get, th there was no um, um, uh, gene flow and the population wasn't big enough that they probably went extinct because if you, if you have an extremely isolated population and you have all that inbreeding, eventually something like genetic entropy happens and you go extinct. Um, mm -hmm. That probably also happened to the Channel Island mammoths. So the Channel Islands are off the coast of California uh, near LA and there are pygmy mammoths on there and they went extinct, but they, we don't, we don't have any direct evidence that humans made it to that Island. Cause uh, it, if we did, that'd be a good reason to believe. I thought humans. those went extinct because of the temperature change. It, it's also possible. Okay. Um, th that's possible too. As, again, I'm not saying we know this, but an Island is the kind of place, uh, a really small, cause channel islands are really tiny. That is a place where you would see something like genetic, uh, entropy happen. But again, I just don't, I think that the combination of natural selection itself, the fact that we know that beneficial mutations happen, I mean, they have to happen. Um, uh, Non-random mating, partner selection or sexual selection and, and gene flow and all these things mitigate the supposed effects of genetic entropy. So in the, in the real world, I just don't I don't think it really holds up at all. Genetic entropy doesn't. Well, I would up. agree that it definitely would be more. It, it's the effect is much more drastic from an inbreeding perspective. If you're all you know, secluded on an island and you have five different or, or you know, a very limited amount of mates, especially with animals, because they're constantly reproducing to breed, they're going to die out. That's going to happen yeah. very quickly. Um, I, I would definitely agree that there's going to be a difference between a mass diverse population mm -hmm. as opposed to a very selective, limited inbred population. I, I agree that, and I don't, I don't think that Sanford would disagree with that either. I think what, it, like the main thing, again, it's going to help after reading these refutations to see if, if your questions are answered or if they're satisfactory, at least. Um, these mutations... They may be beneficial from a coincidental standpoint that I am in a situation to where this is working. So it, it would actually help from a natural for, with natural selection. This would actually be a good thing to mutate. If I had this mutation, this would be good. But overall, you are losing an ability. Does that make sense? Wait, say the part about losing an ability again. So you're like the the fish, like the cave fish, or you're losing the ability, like a, a dog or a fox that becomes white haired or the polar bear that became white haired. They're losing the ability to produce the color in their fur that they used to. But this is actually a good thing because that helps them blend in with their environment. So this would actually go hand in hand with natural selection, although their genes are still mutating. Yeah, but that would go against That's a good point. entropy, though. <laughs> Well, that well, is an example where it actually agrees with genetic entropy is you have a mutation that is added to the gene code that actually helped it survive, but in a circumstantial way, but in the long run can hurt fitness, which we know happens because like with the H. pylori example, you can have a change in the gene code that allows you to survive from the antibacteria, but um, not it makes it harder to reproduce, you know, uh, so. That does yeah. happen sometimes. But, uh, trying to think. 
but the the cave salamander example, we don't have any evidence that it's going to become harmful down the road yet. I wouldn't say, but also um, the reason I said that goes against genetic entropy is because if that mutation, like they 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 gradually lost their ability to see, but it helped with other uh, traits. Like they're they're probably more sensitive to pressure because that's how organisms that live in darkness, especially in water, typically find their prey, right? Um, then that that would mean that the mutation wasn't harmful because it increased their their fitness and Sanford's like again for the millionth time his main thing is that uh, most mutations are harmful and that they the, the other thing this this is part of the thing that we didn't really get into because I don't I don't really have the the mathematical skills to talk about it but but he he insists that the implication is because of that the frequency of harmful mutations must necessarily continuously increase. And I would argue that, that we absolutely don't see that because we don't see populations uh, declining except for cases where like we are causing extinctions, but it has nothing to do with the, the genetics of the organisms. It's us changing their environment. They were doing perfectly well before we start screwing things up with pollution and whatnot. Hmm. Well, that, were you going to say something, Brent? <clears throat> well, I want to ask about uh, if what you believe about the um, the idea of entropy as a whole. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because if genetic entropy isn't true, it seems like the one thing entropy doesn't touch is living organisms, which would be um, <clears throat> strange and um, hard to substantiate. Uh, are you familiar with just entropy and physics um so you know i thought i was but i have a friend who's a phd in physics and he he I, i'm actually writing a book and i had him critique it and he's like you're confusing energy and entropy a lot and i'm like but but aren't they the same thing he's like no um so like one leads to the other but mm -hmm. so i what i entropy is just there are actually many different ways to describe it so like low entropy would be like the, the temperature of something decreases because low entropy means you have more organization, right? So the colder something gets, the, the smaller its distribution curve of its temperature is. Or we can say from a organizational standpoint of matter, lower entropy means that matter coalesces into like, um, like, like a neat array. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Entropy increases over time, meaning that everything, like erosion happens. That's a very good example of you know, a mountain has sort of structure, kind of sort of, but eventually just becomes flat to a to a point of its lowest potential energy, which is a way of saying it like maximizes um, its entropy. So, well, anyways, I I'm, I want to pull something up real quick, but go ahead and continue okay, okay. with whatever you wanted to say. Okay. So yeah, entropy is a measure of disorder and randomness. We could just say, um, and right, there are multiple ways to describe it, but you know. Just according to the second law of thermo, um, entropy is always increasing in a closed system, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I don't think there's any debate there. That's one of the most established laws in all of science. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, that's not going anywhere. But um, so what that then translates to directly in thermodynamics is that uh, there are always parasitic forces that take energy from a useful state and convert it to a useless state. Exergy is the definition. Definition of that is basically energy that is useful, useful energy. Um, and that's, it's always in a closed system decreasing because of these parasitic forces like friction or resistance in wires, um, things like that. And, uh, but then that translates to something bigger than that. Um, that exists in you know the whole universe in fact you know one thing that we do and physicists have done this now for like half a century is uh prove that the universe cannot be eternal they prove against the steady state theory by saying that okay because of entropy everything is winding down we have a level of order now but it can't have always been like that at some point the flashlight has to burn out so to speak you know and and that's the idea that <clears throat> all of the energy that's ordered will become disordered but yeah. then entropy just it goes on 
uh, the idea of it goes on to say that just order is not added by nature. Um, <clears throat> it is only uh, removed. Yes. You know? Classic so example, I you put a car in the woods and it doesn't gain functionality. It, you know, it starts rusting. Yeah, it rusts. Yeah. And um, so I'm thinking just with biology, I, to finish the thought, is that in order for us to say that genetic entropy doesn't exist, we, we would be saying that the gene code is the one thing that is exempt from uh, this overall phenomena of disorder, the growth of disorder. Would sure. you be saying that? No. Um, so oh, okay. it's, it's basically like evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics. It's is kind of essentially what you're saying, right? Yes. Well, I think he's more just saying you could say that, but in this specific context, well, he, he was saying, saying why it does. It's yeah. it's not exactly the second law of thermodynamics because the second law of thermo isn't directly related to everything like rust on a car, mm -hmm. but um, but that the idea that well, it's, nature it's does not add yeah. order. Yeah. So um, I, I'm writing a book and I have a section on this, and um, I'll just I'll just read these like two paragraphs to it. So, um. The, the problem with that state, the problem with saying something like evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics or like we couldn't preserve our genes because of it is that Earth isn't a closed system. Yeah. Um, it, it's an open system and life is an open system as well. So what makes our planet and life part of an open system is the sun. The sun continuously provides Earth with an endless quantity of very, very low entropy energy. Uh, that low entropy energy comes in the form of photons. Um, and it's taken in by photosynthesis and converted into higher entropy living mass uh, with tons of it lost as waste and heat. Um, you, like, for example, if you're going to have a farm and you're going to have cows, you have to have vastly more food for the cows. The, the, the weight of the food has to vastly outweigh that of the cows because so much of it is lost because of inefficiency. And that's entropy in action. Um, I went off script there for that, but um, the, the entropy increases at every step of the ecological food chain and energy is lost to the environment as heat. Um, this is why there is vastly more plants than herbivores and vastly more herbivores than carnivores. So nothing in well, life said. is hundred percent efficient. So while it's true that living things are low entropy compared to their environment, um, like I'm more organized, I'm a more organized form of matter than my environment. Um, that's only in their organization. Uh, living things being organized forms of matter still lose vast amounts of energy into their environment. So we are actually contributing to entropy by doing that. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. other the other major problem um, is that evolution and life in general are also non-random because th that's kind of another part of it. Uh, the, the entropy increases because the the random actions of particles interacting, moving, or whatever will always lead to disorder. But um, that's probably all I need to say about that. That was probably a tangent. We didn't need to go on, I guess. But <clears throat> um, first of all, guess. kudos to writing a book. Uh, that's cool. Second, how is yeah. um, how is evolution not random? Because of natural selection. How so is natural the, selection ultimately not That's random? just a process, though. That's descriptive, not prescriptive. Yeah. So the what causes genetic variation among a population, that is random. But that's not natural selection. And that's that's not really evolution either. The fact that the fact that only some organisms uh so you have a population and there's you know, we have we have a bell curve of of fitness or whatever. Um, the fact that only the ones that are best well suited have statistically greater odds of reproducing, that's the non-random part of it. You don't get like it's literally called non-random mating, right? In like I wouldn't use terms. a bell curve <laughs> to dispel randomness because your variable is called a random variable in doing statistics. It's assuming random, a random distribution. Well, but we can actually well we can actually quantify this. We we don't have to just assume it, it can be counted. But but it's no, also it, natural well, selection is totally not random because only only a small number of the members of any population reproduce. 
right? So the forces that guide evolution are are non-random. The things that produce variation are are random, um, but not not selection itself. So survival of the fittest isn't even fully accurate because it's really survival of the luckiest frequently you know it's not simply you know oh you have the best genes you will survive and so it is a directed process like what you just said the environment can change and things will happen there that will make it like that but it's also time yeah. and place you know to put it all to a specific math inside the bounds of putting natural selection inside the bounds of survival of the fittest would ignore a lot of the disorder that actually exists in the circle of life um i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure what you mean by that um just again that the, the original thing was natural selection itself isn't random yes and, and i'm it, saying that it is uh there's we can't how, how come remove though? randomness from because there's no uh ultimate purpose behind it Yes, it happens to be that you, you know, certain characteristics will survive easier than other characteristics, but that is not incompatible with randomness. Do you know what a Galton board is? No. So a Galton board is just, you know, the game Plinko on the Price is Right? Mm, no. <laughs> so that's the thing. It's like you have a slanted pegboard and you drop like what looks like a, 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 a connect little checker thing. And it goes, yeah. and so it's gonna it's gonna end up somewhere random. The path it takes is going to be random because at every peg, there's a fifty percent chance it goes left, fifty percent chance it goes right. Right. So it, everything about that is random. However, if you were to graph the distribution of where they end up, you get a normal distribution. So a Galton board is. I have one in my classroom. I, I was gonna bring it home, and I. I forgot to, but what it is, is it's just a, a whole bunch of tiny little metal beads, like, like tiny little BBs or shots or whatever. And you drop them down one of these, it, it's a pegboard thing and they form a normal distribution. So it is out of chaos patterns emerge out of the total randomness of it'll either go left or it'll go right. The, the statistics at the bottom don't end up that way because in order for it to go all the way to the left or all the way to the right, you'd have to have a specific left or left. So every time it could go left or right, you have to go left every single time. That's the only way to one of the only ways to end up on the far side. And that's very rare that that will happen. So yes, there, there are elements of total randomness in there, but you can get a pattern out of that. And with natural selection, what I'm saying is there is inherent randomness in the process, but the outcome is very much non-random because uh, it mates or so this isn't how it works for bacteria, obviously, but like females usually choose a mate. There are, there are some species where uh, it's the other way around, which <laughs> those species are kind of funny because they've like flipped family dynamics or whatever. Um, but because of that, and because of, um, uh, I mean, I mean, just the, the genes you inherit are, yeah, it's going to be random. Maybe you are lucky and you have a good immune system. Maybe you're not lucky and you have a crappy immune system. Well, the fact that most organisms in the environment don't have crappy immune systems is not random. It's because those that do have good immune systems have statistically the best chances of surviving long enough to reproduce. And so the population represents them because they reproduce the most. <clears throat> I don't know that that's incompatible with randomness only because when you have certain guidelines, mm, phenomena will land in a certain direction anyway. But like with the bell curve, um, it kind of – statistics presupposes randomness. You actually need randomness in order for statistics to make sense because otherwise it's like you're messing with the data. Um <sighs> That's why they call it a random variable. Um, I'm trying to form what I'm trying to say better. Because if it wasn't random, that would mean a, 
I usually so, think that would mean a mind is involved. Well, so this is the so like if we well, the define organisms, the organisms have something like conscious. I, I would argue that almost any living thing has some kind of consciousness. That's not the same thing as a mind to me. But organisms, they don't necessarily. I, I don't think a bacteria does anything for a reason. But there are reasons why bacteria do things, right? But this is this is the natural selection. I I don't want to cut you off, but the the, the topic was is natural selection random or not and i would argue you do need a mind to have consciousness but that's another topic but uh the so like if we just look at google's random definition made done happening or chosen without a method or conscious decision i i wouldn't say that natural selection you could say you definitely can't say it's a conscious decision because there's no consciousness behind nature um is there a method i, I don't think it's necessarily a method i think it's I mean, you could break it down to a coincidence. I just so happen to have long hair in cold climate. I just so happen to have short hair in uh, warm climate. I just so happen to be bigger and stronger than the predators around me so I can survive. You know, the, I mean, that that's that's what evolution stands on is chance. That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, when you say it's not chance, you're saying it's design. I don't I don't know that we no. have a third option. Is that do we have a dichotomy here? You have chance well, and you have design. Because there's again, there's two things happening here. The the environment, whatever changes happen in the environment, that is that's random in the sense that it's unpredictable. I mean, I, I think we live in a deterministic universe. Um, so actually it is wow. it is sort of predetermined what will happen a thousand years from now. Right. But we don't know what it will be. And the shuffling of genes obviously doesn't know the future either. Right. Um, so like that's random. And the genes that I happen to pass on are randomly reshuffled. And any mutations that occur, occur because of random chance. But again, the odds, the statistical odds of surviving long enough to reproduce are not random and that's why it affects the population that's why the population represents not a bunch of sickly albino the animal like i'm just trying to think of traits you don't want you know stick out like a sore thumb and have a crappy immune system and i don't know have 20 legs because you have some sort of random duplication or mutation or whatever that's why the population doesn't look like that because of the non-random uh aspect of reproduction Okay, would you then so you disagree or do you agree <clears throat> in that dichotomy between chance and design? What was the dichotomy again? There's if it's non-random that means it has to be There's designed. Either yeah. No. What what do you call it if it's not chance or but it's not design? I think your inheritance is chance. Um but I, I don't think the survivability thing is is chance because um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure, but it, I don't think it has to be designed because if we if we live in a universe that operates according to like fixed natural law, then there are reasons that things happen. And so it it's understandable why certain things would be favorable to other things, because certain things have a better fit with the environment, which is under like which is shaped by the climate and gravity and like you know whatever else just these natural forces well we would say that is in indicative of a designer making the natural laws um <clears throat> well I, th I think we'd be arguing something totally outside of evolution at that point um it, it would yeah, be outside even of evolution. I mean, even if <laughs> that'd be even, teleology actually even if i don't th this doesn't necessarily um, validate your worldview because this would validate a deistic worldview as well. Because well said, well said. You're, yeah. you're saying just that, not agnostic atheism. Yeah, just you're not saying naturalism. That the environment, <clears throat> you're saying the environment is the way it is, and our universe does what it does because a designer set it up that way. But it could easily, it could just as easily have been a designer that went All right, do your thing. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's and does not intervene. It would be actually. It would be indistinguishable from my worldview that posits that there wasn't a designer that made everything happen in the first place. Well, that's that. That's why the separation would be from naturalism. Naturalism would be excluded once design is thrown in there, and you'd have theism, deism, and if you want to say that uh, 
um, pantheism is not in there with deism. Which some people would disagree with that. Some people do. Um, so I would say that would either way that that goes. Design would imply <clears throat> something you know beyond nature, something that's that's done a, a made a design. But we've we've actually I think we've hit two hours here. So I think this is a yeah. unless you guys have something that you wanted to throw it on the was, table. There was I, I'm I'm perfectly happy to come back. There's one other thing, which is that mitochondrial Eve paper that you referenced. And I, I yeah. had some things and I could just go over them quickly and we could we could talk about it more next time or whatever. Um, and then I also had uh, some stuff about transitional fossils. I, I focused on Pachycetus for the most part. Uh, we definitely we definitely don't we have time about. for that. Yeah, we definitely don't have time for that. But um, if you're if you're willing, it would take me a few minutes, but I could just talk about that paper. All right, we can do that. We can do that real quick. <clears throat> okay. Um, so instead of before where I went through bullet point and then like, what do you think about that? I, I, I'll just go through these because again, I don't want to take a whole ton of time. But that paper is called the Eve Mitochondrial Consensus by Robert Carter. Hmm. So 2007, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think you should use this paper as a resource. I think there are, there are a lot of problems with it. Uh, the, the first thing is it sort of violates the spirit of what the intention of the argument from the beginning was, which was that we were going to try to divorce ourselves from like a, a biblical nar perspective or narrative, right? Because um, I know, Brendan, you haven't read the paper, but the very first thing that the paper says is um, in order to develop a biblical model of human genetic history, and then it goes on, right? Um, so to me, that's confirmation bias It because it deliberately is set up to back or set out to back up a conclusion. And that's not the way science is supposed to work. Now, everybody is biased. People are biased and biased people do science, but the methodology shouldn't be biased. And I think the immediate reading of this paper shows like a really biased methodology. Uh, the author in the paper says things like, uh, most of the evolutionary assumptions have been questioned in the scientific literature. And then right after making that claim, the author cites himself. So he's not actually citing the evolutionary literature. He's citing a paper that he wrote, which which is very different, right? To me, to me, that's what website like a are you reading that on? What website are you reading that on? Is that the National Library of Medicine? No, it's um, I have here it is. Um, it it it's his it's his paper, the the Eve mitochondrial consensus sequence by Robert W. Carter. Okay, because that's not what it says on National Library of Medicine. So they may have like one that's tailored towards creationists and then one that's because that would never have been accepted in the National Library of Medicine. Once they say biblical time, pff, nope, that wouldn't. Because <laughs> this was actually done, it, Robert, uh, Robert, John Sanford did this with Robert Carter, but he couldn't put his name on it because by this time, they wouldn't have accepted it. He was already, I think, done with Cornell. I think, and I think you're talking about a different paper because he has two papers on this. Um, and I mitochondrial, have... This one is mitochondrial diversity within human populations. And it's the one where they took 827, uh, 827 carefully selected sequences showing modern humans uh, going back through gene sequencing, mere 21.6 NT sites on average. 84.1% of the mitochondrial genome was found to be invariant and private mutation and private mutations accounted yeah, that, for 43. That, that's 8. this one. Yeah. So I, I think it just may be the site that you're reading it on. Like this, I see what you're saying. It's not from a scientific point of view. You want to remain neutral. You don't want to say I'm doing this to prove the biblical timeline. But what I would say is that if it was accepted into the national library of medicine, it's because the science was legitimate. It wasn't, there was no like I, foul I think play. He, I think he wrote two different papers um, on the same thing. Um, so, but but th if anything, like I, I hear what you're saying, like this uh, wouldn't have been accepted. But if anything, because uh, he is a creationist, if anything, yeah. th the paper I'm reading really actually represents his views. 
Um, I, I'll just do a couple more things and then we can, or say the rest of what I wanted to say, and then we can round this off or whatever. Um, um, so he, Carter, he rejects the methodology of other mitochondrial papers on the grounds that they assume we have shared common ancestry. Um, the paper explicitly claims the Genesis flood happened. The paper claims that mitochondrial DNA supports the Tower of Babel story uh, because in some studies that the author references, women have a higher migratory rate than men. And supposedly that fits in with what it says about the Tower of Babel. They were scattered according to paternal lineages or something like that, I think is what it says. Um, he actually uses the phrase direct confirmation of the, of the Babel account. Um, so I feel like that's kind of cherry picking because there is mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome analysis that shows that in some groups, men travel more. So I think he just sort of cherry picked something. I only have a couple more things. Um, the paper outright rejects the, the um, sorry, the paper outright rejects the clear reading of phylogenetic maps of humans in Africa and proposes several hypotheticals that have no evidence for, um, they're, they're just arguments. And he admits that in the paper, um, including, so this is where it gets actually kind of really bad. So this is something that he wrote. So he says that um, the humans in Africa idea probably isn't true because uh, he writes that Africans have quote, defective DNA repair systems. Um, and that, uh, so I, I don't think that's something you should say, but he also says analysis of lifespans of patriarchs shows how the average age of marriage changed dramatically downward in the first generation after the flood. So he, again, he's just sort of, it's from that uh, biblical perspective that we were talking about earlier. Um, we have it, the, the actual evidence says the exact opposite of what he's talking about in here. He, he needs to believe that humans originated in the middle East because he thinks that's more biblically accurate, but the greatest genetic diversity exists in Africa, which is exactly what you would expect for if a population originated somewhere. Um, well, Northern Africa would be like pretty like Middle East, Northern Africa is the same geographical area. So it's, yeah, it's not but the, far off. the, the diversity is really in sub-Saharan Africa, which is, wait, which is, why which does is he, further away. why does he need the, the Middle East to be the place of highest? Uh, Cause that's region? where he thinks the Garden of Eden was. He doesn't think that. Where does he think it was? He, well, he, he, he thinks that humans Earth? originated in the middle east so um he maybe he says that that would be weird because young earth creationist uh belief on that is that uh before the flood was pangea and that under the flood all of the tectonic uh activity happened i mean it was not tectonic drift it was sprint and uh that caused all of the uh continental formation we have today so yeah. the earth didn't even look the same um and this kind of makes sense you know because you have huge sedimentary blankets all over all of the continents and um it would have been laid down by a flood and so to say that oh the middle east before the flood would have been the same as after the flood would have been kind of crazy it would have been way different well if uh, if if earth if if we had pangea and it just broke up then the pretty much every uh place is preserved it just breaks up it'd be like if you took a puzzle that was put together and then broke it apart you don't have you don't have more or fewer pieces the, the everything's the same um so the locations are still you know discrete from each other they just move into different places actually uh no 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 the younger creationist view of the flood is it's very violent i mean there's a lot of silt and stuff moving around um and so I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I do see what you're saying, uh, but actually I just found an error in my logic anyway, because the Bible still says that they landed in the mountains of Ararat. So that's still Middle East. But that um, wouldn't be the, so you'd have the bottleneck and then the population, you can still go back to Adam and Eve, which this study is supposed to go to Eve, not to Noah's wife. So that, um, well, no, because if, if Noah's family are the last living people, that that would make them the that would make one of them mitochondrial Eve. But they would still be descendants of Eve. 
Yeah, but um, I'm trying to. I mean, I, I, I mean, Adam, I have to admit, like that would still mean wherever uh, Noah and his family landed, you would think should be the place of high of highest genetic diversity. Yeah. It doesn't necessitate they, that because they, they be. could have moved. <clears throat> But um, yeah. it it suggests that that was the place of highest. Genetic so diversity. a mito a mitochondrial Eve only means um, that <clears throat> the mitochondrial Eve is a person who everybody alive is related to, but it's not the first person. So if if somehow everybody on Earth died except Adam, you and your family, then a hundred years from now, um, your wife would be mitochondrial Eve. Uh, but that wouldn't mean that 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 your wife was the first woman or anything like that. So Noah's family, somebody in Noah's family would still be mitochondrial Eve. It wouldn't be Eve Eve. Yeah, the mitochondrial Eve mm. data actually forces a um, bottleneck genetic or population bottleneck, which is another way of getting back to the flood, though we'll have to admit most scientists won't do that because they believe that you know that brings in su the supernatural they'll they'll say there was some other bottleneck but it is a backdoor way of saying eh the flood has a point well let's um, go ahead and if you have more points cuz this go ahead and read off the rest of your points cuz this is a totally different paper than than what I'm looking at here i i'll put this again in the chat so you can see wait did i do that no i'll you didn't yet. I think okay. it's. I think it's the same paper. I think he just wrote uh, what he wanted to say in this one. Um, yeah, yeah. One was meant to be um, placed in a, you know, uh, professional. Um, yeah, this is, library this, is or... same, this is the same. It, it's the it's the exact same thing because eight hundred twenty seven is exactly what he says in here. I'll I'll read through more of it, but. Um, Though I only had a couple other things um, in the in the one I'm reading. He used a computer simulation from something called Mendel's something. Do you remember that being in this one? Uh, I think so. Is it Mendel? I don't. Uh, maybe it wasn't Mendel. I can't remember. But he used a computer simulation, um, and he gave it a population size of only a thousand, which is really small. Um, but he did that because he wanted it to be, quote unquote, biblically reasonable, right? So, like, we all have presuppositions, but again, I, I said this before, but I think he kind of corrupted his methodology here. So, and then the last thing is this one was published in the Journal of Creation. And uh, this guy works for, well, I don't know if he works for them or, or what, but it was funded by a group called the Feed My Sheep Foundation, who's, if you go to their website, um, it's a really weird name. But if you go to their website, it, it's currently dedicated to this conspiracy theory that children are being taught sexually explicit content in schools and that, in their own words, a quote unquote sexual holocaust with billions of victims is currently happening. So I only say, I don't mean to say that as an ad hom against the guy. I'm just talking about I think that we that it's like deeply flawed in its methodology because it comes in with a lot of baggage and bias. I'll have to so like with the children being taught sexuality like is he saying this or this is what this company is saying the people that fund him say that he works for them um cuz that's it's it says that's where he's from Robert Carter Feed My yeah. Sheep Foundation blah 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 give its address and all that cuz I know he works for Creation Ministries International which is a, a creation science company um but yeah, oh, as I mean, far like as Elon but, Musk works for 10 companies. Yeah. So. Yeah. But like, that's, if you want to look up Robert Carter, you go on YouTube, you want to watch lectures of him or something, you go mm -hmm. to CMI and you'll find him. Um, but this, this would be again, though, that would be like with the, the sexualization of kids, you can call that a conspiracy theory, but like there's tons of videos of teachers literally admitting they're teaching kids like things that they should not be learning, talking about, sexual activity sexual things in classes in fact there are lawsuits and like t staff all over the country that have been fired um and criminally charged for doing these things so I, w I wouldn't call that a conspiracy theory i don't know how far this company is taking it if they're saying this is every single classroom across the u.s that's not well, they true. say there's billions of victims um 
Uh, this is a this would be a very different yeah that would be weird. But there are a lot yeah. of there are a lot of misconceptions <clears throat> about this. Um, if I can just say something about it for ten for thirty seconds, younger kids are being taught uh, things about their their anatomy, uh, and it seems extremely off putting to to a lot of parents. And then it gets through the telephone game of I heard I heard I heard it. It turns into their doing like sex ed to like third graders or whatever. But the reason they do that is because what research has found is that children who are sexually abused don't even know what's happening to them because nobody teaches them what their bot, what those parts of their body are for. And so they literally can't tell people what happened to them. And so that's why, that's why there's a concerted effort in a lot of places to teach kids about their bodies and other people's bodies. I agree. You probably shouldn't teach a, shouldn't necessarily teach a second grader what sex is, but if they're being abused and they have no idea what the hell is happening to them, then actually maybe there's an argument to tell them what those kinds of things are. So that has nothing to do with evolution. I just, I'm yeah. a teacher and I want yeah. to defend teachers, I guess, but no, that's fair. That's totally fair. Um, well, well, so that's, uh, we'll have to look into those, those outer issues that can potentially roll into this. I would advise that, you look at the National Library of Medicine article because that doesn't have that in he doesn't have like a biblical and and I'll say like to the contrary when you have like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Lewinton right um, nope. he was a, a American evolutionary biologist uh, mathematician I think atheist he, he died he was big time naturalist uh, mathematician geneticist social comment um, social commentator as well. Um, and I, I want to say he worked, I can't remember what school he worked at now. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. He was at, uh, I think he's at Cambridge. Um, and then he was part of the Guggenheim fellowship for natural sciences. He, very, very well-known person. Um, and so he was one of the guys that was part of this. You're not allowed to mention God at all in science and we're not allowed to let God in the door. And so I think this is kind of like the extreme, like the extreme end on the one side would be that it, everything with science has to match up with the Bible. We're not going to do science unless it's going to match up with the Bible. That's too extreme. And then you have the other end where it can't possibly be God. There's no way everything can be, can be explained through naturalism. And, and I would argue like there are many, you know, like what kind of we were mentioning earlier, consciousness. I was saying, I think you have to have a mind to have that. I think I don't think naturalism has an answer for consciousness, but that's that's another argument. But again, there's two extremes and you have to meet in the middle. You have to be like, OK, leave our presuppositions. Whatever your worldview is, is irrelevant. If you just do the scientific method, you can arrive at a, a fair scientific conclusion. I think this paper portrays that in the National Library of Medicine. I got to look at this this other one that you're talking about. But um, other than that, we we are almost at two and a half, two hours, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two hours and thirty minutes. What anything else that you wanted to mention before we we hopped off here? We definitely have to come back and and do another session on this because there's a lot more to talk about. And I, I had a lot of fun. I think this is a great conversation. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got to talk about Pachycetus next time. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. um, yes, okay. sir. No, I mean I I. I appreciated it and it, it was really good. Um, most of my, most of the conversations I have are with, <laughs> are with people who don't have a clue um, about, about anything. And I don't, I don't mean that I disagree with them. I disagree with a lot of people, but they just, oh man, they don't even know what they're talking about. And you guys, you guys are totally fair and polite and, and know things. And so uh, it's a nice change of scenery for me. <laughs> uh, happy to not be that flat earther or <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, anti dinosaur sir. existing person. Oh, I saw someone in the comments kept saying dinosaurs, dinosaurs never existed. existed. That's probably yeah, and I'm a like, troll from one of my from from a follower of mine. I have I okay. don't know, but that's what I would guess. I will say, tell people dinosaurs are in the Bible. I don't know if you do that, but you should tell them because it's like, man, look, yeah. even if you believe the Bible, like, come on, if you're doing the flat earth stuff, you can't throw away dinosaurs, please. <laughs> Not to mention the, you know, thousands of fossils we have of dinosaurs that, yeah, are found no, no, by that's like conspiracy. Don't you know? No. That's conspiracy. Okay. Well, go to Montana and bring a shovel and tell me if it's a conspiracy. Um, but, anyways, uh, I appreciate, you know, you taking the time to come on. 
we'll definitely do this again and continue to talk about Pachycetus, transitional fossils. Um, but other than that, thank you guys so much who've been watching. We still have 28 people watching. So you guys are troopers going through all this with us. Uh, make sure you, you know, save the links that we have in the comments. They're great resources. Um, I can't wait to do this again. And we'll see you guys next time on Truth Over Tea.